everybody. Welcome back to a brand new Strangers Worth Meeting episode. I'm coming at you today again from Tucson. Uh, this is our quarantine hideout right now. Um, but today I'm excited and I've been excited about the most recent episodes because I've been able to get remote with it and start talking to people who are way outside of, of where we've stayed. Uh, and I've got one of those people with me today, uh, Marcos Mena from Los Angeles. Yeah, that'd be kind of hometown, right, Marcos? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and he is a musician. Uh, his band is called Standards, uh, and he's got some real unique uh, stuff that he does. I found you on Instagram because of the particular way that you play guitar, and I'm really excited to talk about it. So thanks for being on the show, man. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. What's been going on in your world during the uh, during the old quarantine here? Well, it's been an interesting time for all musicians because... Uh, musicians uh, that play in bands, the sole source of income and pretty much the the fuel behind what they do is live performance. So we're talking tours and you know in in store appearances and uh, it's a lot of that. And so you as a as a touring musician, you pretty much alternate between you know you, you do like a tour cycle. So you go into the studio, you record an album while it's being worked on. You're doing a little bit of touring before that, and then you announce the record. You go on tour because of that, and then you, you, you just alternated between the studio and and touring. So this has kind of broken this up a lot. And yeah, I, think, I can imagine. Yeah, a lot of people are completely just torn up about this. Um, some people make their sole income off of touring. Um, and honestly, I'm thankful that I don't um, because some people, you know, they just go from tour to tour. And so I've just been at home uh, trying to find ways to be constructive and trying to find ways to... Uh, you know, keep money coming in um, because uh, we're, we're coming out with an album this year and uh, albums are expensive to make, especially when you don't have like a label backing it or anything. So, yeah, it was it was a little bit of an adjustment and it's definitely one that I can see happening to all of my friends and musicians, not just me. Yeah, this is a this is a tough time, um, but, you know, hopefully we, we all get through it. And and obviously this the take of this podcast, we've been talking about this on so many episodes lately. It's been I mean, because it's affecting everything so heavily. Uh, I haven't had a guest who it's not affecting. Um, it's it, it's an odd time. And we're, we try to stay positive and say, like, you know, this thing is going to be over and, and no, we'll be past it. What was the uh, when did the timing kind of affect you guys? Because you were working on the album first. I actually saw. I had seen a post you had made about how you had some tours planned. Did you end up having to cancel a whole lot of stuff then? Yeah, so um, we had started, uh, well, we is just me, but I, I have a team behind me that kind of like helps me do stuff now. So I guess we'll just say we um, had been working with a new drummer named Brody. Brody is from Atlanta, Georgia. So he's not from here uh, in Los Angeles. So he was going to fly here um and we were going to do a, a week of rehearsals and then we were going to go on a tour together and he was going to be his first tour with us and um he was super stoked i was super stoked so basically um i played a show march 6th uh in san francisco with um the studio drummer who does a lot of the studio recordings his name's forrest rice and he plays in a band called covet and they're really cool and we played in san francisco on the 6th we all hung out in the 7th and then the 8th i drove home to la and the 9th um was a week away from brody flying out and he messages me and he's like hey man i don't know if you've seen this coronavirus thing but this is it's not looking good and i was like oh yeah. you know because it was it was a lot of preliminary information and uh, there have been like sars and mers and a lot of other health scares and i don't put too much faith in that because i mean i kind of just assumed that uh, people in the government and other places would be on top of it. And it's just like, well, you just, you never area. know too. You never it, know which is going to be the next one. That's actually like a real threat. You know, what bothers me too, is thinking about to go away off topic, thinking about when this thing's over. I, I wonder how many times we're going to see the headline. This is the next coronavirus. And it just happened in this oh, country. Oh, or well, it's unprecedented, and we're all going to so wonder. It's, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's going to be media fodder for sure, but it's like, I, that's what I thought it was. I thought it was just another like Ebola scare. It's like Ebola is scary and it's real, but it's like um, they can contain it. And I was like, you know what? I think it'll be fine. They're going to they're going to work real. Obviously, you know what? This isn't going to blow up and no big thing. And I went to I, I go to Cal Arts, which is a art school in L.A. And uh, I went there Tuesday, which is the day after that conversation. And everybody, you know, was fine. Everything was normal. And I talked to my guitar teacher who I was taking a lesson with there. And he's like, yeah, I think we're going to move to remote instruction. I'm like, really? Like, this is, 
is, you know, same kind of conversation. And at midnight that night, we all got an email saying, don't come to school. In-person yeah. classes are canceled. Like, you're not, nobody's coming back for the rest of the semester. And I was like, oh, my God. And then, like, that whole week, everything just kind of hit the fan. And I had to cancel all the flights. That tour ended up getting canceled. That would have started in uh, the Midwest. And we were going to go all the way around, uh, like, to New York and a little bit of Canada and all that. So that was all canceled. And everybody, you know, is trying to stay optimistic and being like, this will clear up by May and blah, blah, right. blah. But uh, I was kind of seeing the trend of like, I don't think any live music is going to happen anymore. And we had a tour going to the UK and Europe and we just canceled that. Um, so that was a little upsetting. And I've kind of just thought, I don't think anything else is going to happen for the rest of the year safely anyways. I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, well, from what I can tell, I mean, it's like we may open some things sooner, but uh, in terms of people getting together in large groups for live performances, it sounds like that's going to be the hardest hit, the last thing to come back on its feet after this whole thing is over. That is totally unfortunate. I was I was a little bit with you where I was like, you know, we, we didn't really know. I try not to take in like way too much news. I just think it doesn't really serve me all that well. Um, but I knew that this was something people were talking about and then sort of on the tail end of it was I, we were staying in, uh, in San Antonio, actually, Andrea and I were staying there and we had tickets to go to a, to a show in Austin. It was a Keen concert, if you know Keen at all. And, um, they canceled that show like right before it happened. It was right when South by Southwest was getting canceled and all that stuff in Austin. And that was, that was totally unfortunate, which actually, uh, staying in San Antonio, that's actually how I came across you. Did you, uh, I, I don't think I even told you how I how I found your music or, or anything like that. You just got a message from me out of the blue and said yes. Yeah. So like kudos to you. Um, that's really cool of you because mostly I'll message people uh, and I'm like, hey, I'm staying in your town. Let's interview. That's the point of the podcast, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I'll scour Instagram for cool things that are happening within the town I'm staying at. I happen to be staying in San Antonio. You had posted a picture of a concert there. I went to your profile and I was blown away by your music, man. Like the the technicality in the way you play guitar is something I have never seen before. I think everybody, uh, I almost want people to like really quick, go pause the podcast and watch the stuff you do before we talk about it. Cause it, it's, it's hard for me to, at least to explain. I'm sure you can put it into real words for people. So real quick, if you want to pause, he's at Marcos R Mena, uh, on Instagram and go watch that real quick. So, Tell me about this uh, style of, of tapping that you do. Where, where did that come from? So I, I, guitar tapping is kind of like this this weird underdog story with guitar playing. I think a lot of guitar players um, are really like, interested in rock and blues, and I think that's like the majority of guitar playing. And I was one of those people when I was younger because I didn't really have any musical cues to go off of. But um, I think when everyone goes to college, they get into like weirder sort of stuff. And when I was going to college, I started taking lessons from this guy I had heard his record. It was called X'd Out, and his band is called Terramellos. His name's Nick, Nick Reinhardt. And um, I thought it was a cool record. I didn't really know what I was listening to, but I was like, this is really cool. This is a little outside of my realm of interest. And um, I went to the Facebook, and he was doing guitar lessons. And so I ended up doing a bunch of in-person guitar lessons with him before I went to college for the first time. I was like 17 years old. And Had you been playing guitar already? Yeah, but my mom was like, um, kind of weird about it like she was like you know that's a cool little parlor trick you got there but this is you know we get, <laughs> you got to get a job and I was like oh okay so yeah. I was like I was going to college for political science or something which I didn't want to do it was just like all right that'll be my real job and then I can right. play guitar but anyway I took lessons with this guy and <laughs> he he's very much the um, epicenter of like he's at the epicenter of everything that's like alternative experimental unique so we're talking all sorts of corners of the musical kingdom i don't know how well versed you are in a lot of those things some people i talk to you know very well versed and then some people i talk to they have like no idea what i'm talking about and that's totally okay. in terms of in terms of like like uh an understanding of music or like a background of music or a knowledge of the scene uh the, the scene it's, it's like it's like progressive rock um is like the big umbrella term so you know it's a lot of stuff that's we're playing with what's called an odd time signature and i don't know how well versed yeah. you are and okay so an odd time signature Basically, most all music that we hear in the uh, United States is in a time signature called 4-4. So the top number would be how many beats we have. And the bottom number is how long those beats are. So 4-4, four, four, 
basically to a musician means you're four so counting in four it's four just... quarter notes right so yeah you, know, you, you got your country song like or whatever uh i don't listen to country so <laughs> you have <laughs> you, you just have four beats essentially right um a lot of progressive rock music you can actually go down like a rabbit hole of of time signatures there's really no end to this stuff the hard part about doing this is making it danceable so when i was listening to a lot of in time signature music it's like oh crazy this is in 13 this is in seven this is in you know whatever and it's like so to the outsider that sounds so complex like, oh my god that's so hard and complex and um basically i was learning all this stuff before i even went to music school which is where i go now and um understanding it then was a little complex too but it's like right. that is at the heart of a lot of progressive rock music is odd time signatures you've got a lot of alternative techniques so something that you caught your eye was like a lot of my tapping and stuff that's it's not it's not not unique but it also is is not unique it's like a lot of people do it but i think um what i've been doing is trying to push it to another level and uh just you know getting cues from a lot of people so one of those people was my guitar teacher nick reinhardt he was um very big into tapping and so a lot of stuff that he was doing i was like oh this is cool and then once i got the hang of it i was like let me see if i can take this a little further i want to see if i can like do some more stuff with it so basically from then to now which has been about four years i've just been doing that and um when i got to art school i ended up leaving and uh deciding like okay i'm not going to do this like phony you know political science degree or like a business degree or whatever i was bouncing around i'm like this is stupid i'm going to go to art school and i'm going to do it you know i'm going to do it for real and uh, I started uh, the band that I'm in now that I played in San Antonio with uh, called Standards. And the idea of the band was basically take all of these techniques. And I'm not going to use a guitar pick. So this is very unconventional to begin with. Most guitar players use a guitar pick. No guitar yep. picks. And yep. I'm going to be the only melodic voice. So it's just going to be guitar and drums. No bass player. Yeah. No other guitarist. No keyboard. No nothing. It's just, That's all you're hearing. So um, basically, I was doing a ton of problem solving and it was very it's very like college story of like well this doesn't exist so i'm gonna make it exist and there you know i do a lot of research and it's like you find so many bands that had that same idea before you but none of them you know really made it to see the light of day um yeah i'm trying to think of just guitar and drums and i'm thinking black keys and i'm black thinking keys. uh like white jack stripes? white wasn't he white stripes yeah 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 yeah, yeah but that's I'm... about that that's the places i can think of because at, even at the sort of most minimal you've got like rush where you've got a trio so you've at least got bass in there and then also you know he sings they all three sing yeah well i think i think rush is a four piece but i'm not a rush expert pretty sure though uh um, well they're four piece you know what this is the one i do know and actually i was going to tell you this before so so um i'm glad you did like a music like a little bit of a breakdown on the theory there because i feel like i understand so much better what you do I, I wasn't going to cut in on you. I actually do have a background in music, so like gotcha. that's kind of okay. stuff I'm familiar with, but I'm glad because I don't know that every listener will necessarily know that that's how that works. Um, and then I know, like, I know a lot about certain bands, but I don't know, I don't know a little about every band. You know what I mean? Like, I'm very much like, I know a lot about the bands I actually listen to. Yeah, no, no, up. no, no, super fair. I, 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 um, yeah, I just try to approach it. It's, it's just hard because I don't want to patronize people, but it's also like, uh, if I start no, you're, bouncing in you're right to do directions, it. then people have no idea what I'm talking On about. A, on a podcast like this, especially because, you know, I get such a wide range of people listening to this. And I want it to be engaging for everyone to, to understand this. And and uh, but Rush luckily is the one of the ones I know a lot about because my my dad raised me on them. He was a super fan back in the day and I've been to their concerts. And so it's a three person group. But you're right. There's a fourth instrument in that occasionally the lead singer plays bass or synthesizer. So you've got you've got guitar bass drums or guitar synthesizer drums i so see okay there's there's your rush trivia for the day okay gotcha yeah okay so anyway um <laughs> so yeah i mean like there's tons of them there's like you've got hella um which was zach hill who's fame more famous now for death grips i don't know if you've ever heard of death grips um but no, they were pretty, pretty big all. cyber cyberpunk uh thing. doing the you're saying doing guitar and drums only yeah, so that, that but that's hella. Um, the drummer Zach Hill later went on to best be known for Death Grips. They're like probably his most successful group. But like Hella was like his small sort of like uh, when he's playing in like small DIY clubs. That was like his band, sure. and that was okay. two two piece. And that is like unreal. If you listen to that, it's like it's just like nothing you've ever heard before. It's it's just visceral and 
clean guitar just into a stack and just the most insane drumming you've ever heard like absolutely zach hill like is probably the most coveted drummer in the scene of just like the dude can play super fast but is also just completely it's not fast like he he opened a drum book and he just learned how to play it's like he he was trapped in a cave by himself for 10 years and then he just came out and he's like <laughs> i know how to drum but it's like this weird awkward he's on a journey style. yeah 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 it's, it's super weird and um, yeah, I was just finding tons of two piece groups and I was like, all right, man, I'm going to try to make this sound like as dope as possible. So I actually when I was in college, I would uh, take like money that I needed for textbooks and I would just buy guitar pedals instead, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> I just was like I don't I, that I've known some guitarists and that's that's exactly what you guys do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, I, I get I get like, like I got this new or a hundred dollars for a textbook <laughs> and I just be like, you know, what? I'm going to buy a guitar pedal. And uh, yeah, I would, right. uh, so I bought this pedal. And basically what it does is um, you run the guitar through it and it takes half of your signal and it takes it down an octave, which is the um, an octave is is kind of like what differentiates a bass and a guitar. So I was doing rehearsals um, with the drummer at the time and I was just playing through the guitar and I was like, man, it needs that low end. It needs that bass. But it's like we don't want a bass player. We want to like just keep it the two of us. And so. The idea was like maybe if I split my signal, if I have one like guitar path signal going into my amp and the other one going into this pedal that goes into a bass amp, maybe it'll sound like a bass player. And within like five minutes, I had like tweaked it and I was like, okay, that works. Like that's that's like really weird. And it was like the sixty dollar pedal that I picked up. I was like, I just wanted it. I never thought I could do anything with it. But basically, it activates when I play the lowest three strings of my guitar. So I can pick up any guitar plug it into Whoa. this pedal chain I have and the lowest three strings, not only are they a guitar, but they're also a bass, but then the highest three strings are just guitar. So, right. So this is what people need to understand too. And I, I seriously hope someone paused and went and listened to your stuff because you are playing two guitars at the same time. I'm playing like, like you're playing three instruments. It's physically one. Yes. Yeah, seriously. It, it, I don't understand it, but it's part of that. It's part of that tapping method. It's almost like, it's almost like you do when your hands are on a keyboard where you have, the low end that you're playing with one hand and the top end that you're playing with the other hand. And it's the same thing. Only you've done that managed to do that with a guitar. Right. But the, yeah. the thing that hits me is, well, I, I don't know. Hopefully we can get into the, the mentality here because I, I could never hope to think of two things at the same time in that way. And like, you know, you hear all sorts of things about how scientists say that, that uh, multitasking is impossible for humans, but you sir seem to pull it off. Like, it's it's so hard to comprehend how you're playing two things at once. How how do you mean that you're playing three at once sometimes? So well, I mean, if you count the bass signal, because then you've had, got a guitar part that's doubled with the low end, and then yeah. you've got so and then so sometimes they're different. So I mean, I guess independent independent voices would be two, but it's like when people listen to the record, they think there's like four people on the record, got and it. then they yeah. come come to the show and they're like, yeah, I was really confused because I listened to the record, but it sounded like there was a full band, but it's just you and some other guy. I was really con really confused by that and i was like well i don't know like to me it sounds like that but i guess you know if you just listen to it, it it's kind of weird so i mean that takes me back to the progression of everything so i was playing you know riffs like i just play like a single riff and then it was doubled so it was like doubled with this low octave signal and i was like man i want to do like more independent things i wanted to sound like two different things at once so i i didn't really know how to start that because you know, that's that's also like a very weird corner of guitar. Um, probably the only guitarist that got any mainstream notoriety for that uh, was Stanley Jordan. He was a jazz guitarist, most prominent in the 80s. And he did a style of jazz music that nobody had seen before, where instead of playing um, keyboard, you know, with two hands, he would do it on guitar. So he would play the guitar like he'd play it kind of a little more flat. And he was this the dude from like Roadhouse, the blind guy. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh man, I swear you're describing the same. That's just so funny because I literally just watched that movie with and showed it to Andrea. But have you seen that movie Roadhouse? You know, it's um, oh shit, I'm gonna lose his name right now. Oh man, the guy from Ghost and the uh, real Bruce big eighty star. No. Shit. Patrick this Swayze. Is, this is totally embarrassing. Thank you, Patrick Swayze. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm looking you, it up do you know now this movie? Cause just because I'm curious. Uh, at the very least, what you're describing reminds me of that dude from that movie. Yeah. It's about the right time period. It doesn't look like he's in it, but um, yeah, you should just you should just watch videos of him performing because it's 
it's like the proto yeah. what I was trying to do, and I didn't realize it until I found him, and I was like, oh man, that's like what I want to do. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to a brand new Strangers Worth Meeting episode. I'm coming at you today again from Tucson. Uh, This is our quarantine hideout right now. Um, But today I'm excited and I've been excited about the most recent episodes because I've been able to get remote with it and start talking to people who are way outside of of where we've stayed. Uh, And I've got one of those people with me today, uh, Marcos Mena from Los Angeles. Yeah, that'd be kind of hometown, right Marcos? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, And he is a musician. Uh, His band is called Standards, uh, and he's got some real unique uh, stuff that he does. I found you on Instagram because of the particular way that you play guitar, and I'm really excited to talk about it. So thanks for being on the show, man. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. What's been going on in your world during the uh, the old quarantine here? Well, it's been an interesting time for all musicians because... Uh, musicians uh, that play in bands, the sole source of income and pretty much the the fuel behind what they do is live performance. So we're talking tours and, you know, in, in store appearances and uh, it's a lot of that. And so you, as a, as a touring musician, you pretty much alternate between, you know, you, you do like a tour cycle. So you go into the studio, you record an album while it's being worked on, you're doing a little bit of touring before that. And then you announce the record, you go on tour because of that. And then, you, you, you just alternated between the studio and and touring. So this has kind of broken this up a lot. And Yeah, I, think, I can imagine. Yeah, a lot of people are completely just torn up about this. Um, some people make their sole income off of touring. Um, and honestly, I'm thankful that I don't um, because some people, you know, they just go from tour to tour. And so I've just been at home uh, trying to find ways to be constructive and trying to find ways to... Uh, you know, keep money coming in um, because uh, we're, we're coming out with an album this year and uh, albums are expensive to make, especially when you don't have like a label backing it or anything. So yeah, it was, it was a little bit of an adjustment and it's definitely one that I can see happening to all of my friends that are musicians, not just me. Yeah, this is a, this is a tough time. Um, but you know, hopefully we, we all get through it. And, and obviously this, the take of this podcast, we've been talking about this on so many episodes lately. It's been, I mean, because it's affecting everything so heavily, uh, I haven't had a guest who it's not affecting. Um, it's, it, it's an odd time and we we try to stay positive and say like, you know, this thing is going to be over and, and no, we'll be past it. What was the, uh, when did the timing kind of affect you guys? Because you were working on the album first. I actually saw, I had seen a post you had made about how you had some tours planned. Did you end up having to cancel a whole lot of stuff then? Yeah, so um, we had started, uh, well, we is just me, but I I have a team behind me that kind of like helps me do stuff now. So I guess we'll just say we um, had been working with a new drummer named Brody. Brody is from Atlanta, Georgia. He's not from here uh, in Los Angeles. So he was going to fly here, um, and we were going to do a, a week of rehearsals, and then we were going to go on a tour together, and he was going to be his first tour with us, and um, he was super stoked. I was super stoked. So basically, um, I played a show March 6th uh, in San Francisco with um, the studio drummer who does a lot of the studio recordings. His name's Forrest Rice, and he plays in a band called Covet, and they're really cool. And we played in San Francisco on the 6th. We all hung out on the 7th, and then the 8th, I drove home to L.A., and the ninth um, was a week away from Brody flying out. And he messages me and he's like, hey, man, I don't know if you've seen this coronavirus thing, but this is, this is not looking good. And I was like, oh, yeah. you know, because it was, it was a lot of preliminary information. And uh, there have been like SARS and MERS and a lot of other health scares. And I don't put too much faith in that because, I mean, I kind of just assumed that uh, people in the government and other places would be on top of it and it's just like well, you just you never area. know too you never know which is going to be the next one that's actually like a real threat you know what bothers me too is thinking about to go away off topic thinking about when this thing's over i wonder how many times we're going to see the headline this is the next coronavirus and it just happened in this oh, country oh or well, it's unprecedented. And we're all going to so wonder it's, yeah. yeah well it's, it's going to be media fodder for sure but it's like Absolutely. I, that's what I thought it was. I thought it was just another like Ebola scare. It's like Ebola is scary and it's real, but it's like um, they can contain it. And I was like, you know what? I think it'll be fine. They're going to they're going to work real. Obviously, you know what? This isn't going to blow up into a big thing. And 
I went to I, I go to Cal Arts, which is a art school in LA, and uh, I went there Tuesday, which is the day after that conversation. And everybody, you know, was fine. Everything was normal. And I talked to my guitar teacher, who I was taking a lesson with there, and he's like, "Yeah, I think we're gonna move to remote instruction." I'm like, "Really? Like this is this? You know, same kind of conversation." And at midnight that night, we all got an email saying, "Don't come to school. In person yeah. classes are canceled." Like you're not nobody's coming back for the rest of the semester. And I was like, oh, my God. And then like that whole week, everything just kind of hit the fan and I had to cancel all the flights. That tour ended up getting canceled. That would have started in uh, the Midwest and we were going to go all the way around uh, like to New York and a little bit of Canada and all that. So that was all canceled. And everybody, you know, is trying to stay optimistic and being like, this will clear up by May and blah, blah, right. blah. But uh, I was kind of seeing the trend of like, I don't think any live music is going to happen anymore. And we had a tour going to the UK and Europe and we just canceled that. Um, so that was a little upsetting. And I've kind of just thought, I don't think anything else is going to happen for the rest of the year safely. Anyways, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, from what I can tell, I mean, it's like we may open some things sooner, but uh, in terms of people getting together in large groups for live performances, it sounds like that's going to be the hardest hit, the last thing to come back on its feet after this whole thing is over. That is totally unfortunate. I was I was a little bit with you where I was like, you know, we, we didn't really know. I try not to take in like way too much news. I just think it doesn't really serve me all that well. Um, but I knew that this was something people were talking about. And then sort of on the tail end of it was I, we were staying in uh, in San Antonio, actually. Andrea and I were staying there, and we had tickets to go to a to a show in Austin. It was a Keen concert, if you know Keen at all, and um, they canceled that show like right before it happened. It was right when South by Southwest was getting canceled and all that stuff in Austin, and that was that was totally unfortunate. Which actually, uh, staying in San Antonio, that's actually how I came across you. Did you? Uh, I, I don't think I even told you how I how I found your music or or anything like that. You just got a message from me out of the blue and said yes. Yeah. So like kudos to you. Um, that's really cool of you because mostly I'll message people. Uh, and I'm like, hey, I'm staying in your town. Let's interview. That's the point of the podcast, you know. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, so I'll scour Instagram for cool things that are happening within the town I'm staying at. I happen to be staying in San Antonio. You had posted a picture of a concert there. I went to your profile and I was blown away by your music, man. Like the the technicality in the way you play guitar is something I have never seen before. I think everybody. Uh, I almost want people to like really quick go pause the podcast and watch the stuff you do before we talk about it because it, it's it's hard for me to at least to explain i'm sure you can put into real words for people so real quick if you want to pause he's at marcos r mena uh, on instagram and go watch that real quick so tell me about this uh style of of tapping that you do where, where did that come from so I, I guitar tapping is kind of like this this weird underdog story with guitar playing i think a lot of guitar players um, are really like, interested in rock and blues. And I think that's like the majority of guitar playing. And I was one of those people when I was younger because I didn't really have any musical cues to go off of. But um, I think when everyone goes to college, they get into like weirder sort of stuff. And when I was going to college, I started taking lessons from this guy. I had heard his record. It was called x Out. And his band is called Caramellos. His name's Nick, Nick Reinhardt. And... Um, I thought it was a cool record. I didn't really know what I was listening to, but I was like, this is really cool. This is a little outside of my realm of interest. And um, I went to the Facebook and he was doing guitar lessons. And so I ended up doing a bunch of in-person guitar lessons with him before I went to college for the first time. So I was like 17 years old. And Had you been playing guitar already? Yeah, but my mom was like um, kind of weird about it. Like she was like, you know, that's a cool little parlor trick you got there but this is you know we get, <laughs> you got to get a job and i was like oh okay so yeah. i was like i was going to college for political science or something which i didn't want to do it was just like all right that'll be my real job and then i can right. play guitar but anyway i took lessons with this guy and <laughs> he he's very much the um, epicenter of like he's at the epicenter of everything that's like alternative experimental unique so we're talking all sorts of corners of the musical kingdom i don't know how well versed you are in a lot of those things. Some people I talk to, you know, very well versed. And then some people I talk to, they have like no idea what I'm talking about. And that's totally okay. In terms of 
in terms of like like uh, an understanding of music or like a background of music or a knowledge of the scene. Uh, the, the scene it's it's like it's like progressive rock um, is like the big umbrella term. So you know it's a lot of stuff that's we're playing with what's called an odd time signature, and I don't know how well versed yeah. you are. And okay, so an odd time signature, basically most all music that we hear in uh, United States is in a time signature called four four. So the top number would be how many beats we have. And the bottom number is how long those beats are. So 4-4, four, four, basically, to a musician, means you're four... So counting in four, it's Four just... quarter notes, right. So yeah. you, know, you, you got your country song, like... Or whatever. Uh, I don't listen to country. So <laughs> you, have, <laughs> you, you just have four beats, essentially, right? Um, a lot of progressive rock music, you can actually go down like a rabbit hole of of time signatures there's really no end to this stuff the hard part about doing this is making it danceable so when i was listening to a lot of time signature music it's like oh crazy this is in 13 this is in seven this is in you know whatever and it's like so to the outsider that sounds so complex like, oh my god that's so hard and complex and um basically i was learning all this stuff before i even went to music school which is where i go now and um understanding it then was a little complex too but it's like right. that is at the heart of a lot of progressive rock music is odd time signatures you've got a lot of alternative techniques so something that you caught your eye was like a lot of my tapping and stuff that's it's not it's not not unique but it also is is not unique it's like a lot of people do it but i think um what i've been doing is trying to push it to another level and uh just you know getting cues from a lot of people so one of those people was my guitar teacher nick reinhardt he was um very big into tapping and so a lot of stuff that he was doing i was like oh this is cool and then once i got the hang of it i was like let me see if i can take this a little further i want to see if i can like do some more stuff with it so basically from then to now which is about about four years i've just been doing that and um when i got to art school i ended up leaving and uh deciding like okay i'm not going to do this like phony you know political science degree or like a business degree or whatever i was bouncing around i'm like this is stupid i'm going to go to art school and i'm going to do it you know i'm going to do it for real and uh, I started uh, the band that I'm in now that I played in San Antonio with uh, called Standards. And the idea of the band was basically take all of these techniques and I'm not going to use a guitar pick. So this is very unconventional to begin with. Most guitar players use a guitar pick. No guitar yep. picks. And yep. I'm going to be the only melodic voice. So it's just going to be guitar and drums. No bass player, yeah. no other guitarist, no keyboard, no nothing. It's just, That's all you're hearing. So um, basically, I was doing a ton of problem solving and it was very it's very like college story of like well this doesn't exist so i'm gonna make it exist and there you know i do a lot of research and it's like you find so many bands that had that same idea before you but none of them you know really made it to see the light of day um yeah i'm trying to think of just guitar and drums and i'm thinking black keys and i'm black thinking keys. uh like white jack stripes? white wasn't he white stripes yeah 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 yeah, yeah but that's I'm... about that that's the places i can think of because at, even at the sort of most minimal you've got like rush where you've got a trio so you've at least got bass in there and then also you know he sings they all three sing yeah well i think i think rush is a four piece but i'm not a rush expert pretty sure though uh um, well they're four piece you know what this is the one i do know and actually i was going to tell you this before so so um i'm glad you did like a music like a little bit of a breakdown on the theory there because i feel like i understand so much better what you do I, I wasn't going to cut in on you. I actually do have a background in music, so like gotcha. that's kind of okay. stuff I'm familiar with, but I'm glad because I don't know that every listener will necessarily know that that's how that works. Um, and then I know, like, I know a lot about certain bands, but I don't know a, I don't know a little about every band. You know what I mean? Like, I'm very much like I know a lot about the bands I actually listen to. Yeah, no, no, up. no, no, super fair. I, 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 um, yeah, I just try to approach it. It's, it's just hard because I don't want to patronize people, but it's also like, uh, if I start no, you're, bouncing in you're right to do directions, it. then people have no idea what I'm talking On about. A, on a podcast like this, especially because, you know, I get such a wide range of people listening to this. And I want it to be engaging for everyone to, to understand this. And and uh, but Rush luckily is the one of the ones I know a lot about because my my dad raised me on them. He was a super fan back in the day and I've been to their concerts. And so it's a three person group. But you're right. There's a fourth instrument in that occasionally the lead singer plays bass or synthesizer. So you've got you've got guitar bass drums or guitar synthesizer drums i so see okay there's there's your rush trivia for the day okay gotcha yeah okay so anyway um <laughs> so yeah i mean like there's tons of them there's like you've got hella um which was zach hill who's fame more famous now for death grips i don't know if you've ever heard of death grips um 
but no, they were pretty pretty big all. cyber cyberpunk uh thing. doing the you're saying doing guitar and drums only yeah so that, that but that's hella um the drummer zach hill later went on to best be known for death grips they're like probably his most successful group but like hella was like his small sort of like uh when he's playing in like small diy clubs that was like his band sure. and that was okay. two, two piece and that is like unreal if you listen to that it's like it's just like nothing you've ever heard before it's it's just visceral and clean guitar just into a stack and just the most insane drumming you've ever heard like absolutely zach hill like is probably the most coveted drummer in the scene of just like the dude can play super fast but is also just completely it's not fast like he he opened a drum book and he just learned how to play it's like he he was trapped in a cave by himself for 10 years and then he just came out and he's like <laughs> i know how to drum but it's like this weird awkward he's on a journey style. yeah 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 it's, it's super weird and um yeah i was just finding tons of two-piece groups and i was like all right man i'm gonna try to make this sound like as dope as possible so i actually when i was in college i would uh take like money that i needed for textbooks and i would just buy guitar pedals instead which is like <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I don't I, need that I've known some guitarists, and that's that's exactly what you guys do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, I get, I get like, like I got this new pedal, man. hundred dollars for a textbook, and I just be like, you know what? I want to buy a guitar pedal. And uh, yeah, I right. would, uh, so I bought this pedal, and basically what it does is, um, you run the guitar through it, and it takes half of your signal, and it takes it down an octave, which is the um, an octave is is kind of like what differentiates a bass and a guitar. So I was doing rehearsals um, with the drummer at the time, and I was just playing through the guitar, and I was like, man, it needs that low end. It needs that bass. But it's like, we don't want a bass player. We want to like just keep it the two of us. And so the idea was like, maybe if I split my signal, if I have one like guitar path signal going into my amp and the other one going into this pedal that goes into a bass amp, maybe it'll sound like a bass player. And within like five minutes, I had like tweaked it. And I was like, okay, that works. Like that's, that's like really weird and it was like the $60 pedal that I picked up I was like I just wanted it and I never thought I could do anything with it but basically it activates when I play the lowest three strings of my guitar so I can pick up any guitar plug it into Whoa. this pedal chain I have and the lowest three strings not only are they a guitar but they're also a bass but then the highest three strings are just guitar so right so this is what people need to understand too and I, I seriously hope someone paused and went and listened to your stuff because you are playing two guitars at the same time. I'm playing like, like you're playing three it's, instruments. It's physically, one, yes, seriously. It, it, I don't understand it, but it's part of that. It's part of that tapping method. It's almost like it's almost like you do when your hands are on a keyboard, where you have the low end that you're playing with one hand and the top end that you're playing with the other hand, and it's the same thing. Only you've done that, managed to do that with a guitar, right? But the yeah. the thing that hits me is, well, I I don't know. Hopefully, we can get into the the mentality here because I I could never hope to think of two things at the same time in that way and like you know you hear all sorts of things about how scientists say that that uh multitasking is impossible for humans but you sir seem to pull it off like it's it's so hard to comprehend how you're playing two things at once how, how do you mean that you're playing three at once sometimes so well i mean if you count the bass signal because then you've got a guitar part that's doubled with the low end and then yeah you've got, so and then so sometimes they're different so, I mean, I guess independent voices would be two, but it's like when people listen to the record, they think there's like four people on the record. Got and it. then they yeah. come, come to the show and they're like, yeah, I was really confused because I listened to the record, but it sounded like there was a full band, but it's just you and some other guy. I was really, con really confused by that. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like to me, it sounds like that. But I guess, you know, if you just listen to it, it it's kind of weird. So, I mean, that takes me back to the progression of everything. So I was playing you know, riffs, like I just play like a single riff and then it was doubled. So it was like doubled with this low octave signal. And I was like, man, I want to do like more independent things. I wanted to sound like two different things at once. So I, I didn't really know how to start that because, you know, that's, that's also like a very weird corner of guitar. Um, probably the only guitarist that got any mainstream notoriety for that uh, was Stanley Jordan. He was a jazz guitarist, most prominent in the eighties. And he, did a style of jazz music nobody had seen before where instead of playing um, keyboard, you know, with two hands, he would do it on guitar. So he would lay the guitar, like he'd play it kind of a little more flat. And he was. Would... Is this the dude from like Roadhouse, the blind guy? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh man, I swear you're describing the same. That's just so funny because I literally just watched that movie with and showed it to Andrea. But have you seen that movie, Roadhouse? You know, it's. Um... 
Oh shit, I'm gonna lose his name right now. Oh man, the guy from Ghost and the uh, real Bruce big Willis? 80s star. No. Shit. Patrick this Swayze. Is, this is totally embarrassing. Thank you, Patrick Swayze. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm looking you, it up do you know this movie? Cause I'm, just because I'm curious. Um, At the very least, what you're describing reminds me of that dude from that. Movie. Yeah. It's about the right time period. It doesn't look like he's in it, but um. Yeah, you should just you should just watch videos of him performing because it's. It's like the proto yeah. what I was trying to do, and I didn't realize it until I found him, and I was like, "Oh man, that's like what I want to do." But it's like I didn't know it existed, and so he. I'm talking about Jeff Healy, apparently. That's okay. My bad. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, go on. But go on. I mean, he's he's not the only one to do it, but he's definitely. Yeah. I would say the most prominent because he would have like songs that would chart, but pe- nobody knew it was like right. just one person. They thought it was like two guitarists playing at the same time, and yeah. so everyone like. From Victor Wooten and the Wooten family, which is like an insane family musicians, to like tons of guitarists coming up at the time, were just like listening to this. Just like, what the hell? Like this dude is like, he he sounds like he's he would comp his own jazz solos. Like he would like play chords on the low end of the guitar, and then on the high end, he'd be taking another hand and soloing over it. So that's like insane multitasking, and he could yeah, improv over real. it. So he would just know the changes and just be able to improv. And so when I found that, I was like, okay, I got to do something like that, but. I wasn't learning his stuff. I was just looking at that and being like, okay, this is possible somehow. I just don't really know how. So I thought about pianists and I thought about how, like, if a pianist does something like that where they comp over themselves, nobody's going like, wow. Like, like obviously people think that's cool, but it's like somebody does on guitar. People are like, holy shit, like, what is, what is that? And I was yeah. like, okay, so I should just learn how to play piano on guitar, essentially. So I looked up every piano exercise that someone would do to gain independence and there were so many and I just started learning them every day and practicing just a lot of that of just like it's, it would start with something super simple. Like uh, I think I learned like a Miley Cyrus song where I would just like with one hand would be playing like the the singing part, you know, just like phoning that out. And then the other hand, I would be playing the chords. And It was really hard. It took me like hours just to get this simple Miley Cyrus song down. And then I went from that to like, OK. I should try to learn a piano piece. What's a good piano piece to learn all this independent stuff? And I, I Google that and it's like, you should learn Bach. And I'm like, oh, okay. I've never <laughs> like listened to Bach at length. And he's got a series of pieces called The Inventions. And basically they're 15 pieces that he would give to students. And um, they're all in a different key of music. So a key basically is just like a tonal center. And there are um, uh, a bad musician. I think there's about 32 of them if you count major and minor i'm not gonna get too geeky with it but um mixolydian yeah well <laughs> now i'm just throwing words in there. <laughs> let's, yeah let's just keep doing that and confuse it. yeah <laughs> no but he um he, he basically just wrote all these piano pieces and right. i learned one and it took me three months to do but i did it and then i learned another one and that took me only a month to do and then i learned another one and that took me two weeks and i just kept learning them and Basically, it's like what you're saying. It's like two parts at once. So it's like you're switching focus because you're right. You can't focus on two things at once. But what you can do is switch your focus really fast, which is what multitasking is essentially. Like when you're multitasking, you're not doing two things at once. The the human brain can't physically do that. But you can improve how fast you switch between two things. So I would kind of compartmentalize like parts that I was doing. And um, you can take like one pattern and see it and then you can be like okay that it's that pattern and then with the other hand you can pay attention to it well it's like oh the other hand is doing this pre-learned pattern essentially so yeah it was it was a trip like it was a very big year for me just like learning all this stuff and then I started writing I was like okay now let's take all this and let's make uh like riffs that I like like let's make songs that I like with the same technique and then I got enough material essentially for the first standard EP, which came out in 2018. And at the time, we had not really been playing a lot of shows. Um, but the ones we did, we got a really good response. But it, it was just kind of like, we were just like, what the hell is this project? We're like, we have no bass player. We're just, like, we're just, we would play like parties at my school. People would just kind of stand there very, like very confused. And I was like, is this, is this bad? <laughs> yeah. Like, this might be bad. And I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. It was just a weird time. And so we recorded this thing. I mixed it um, because at the time I was just like, you know what, I can mix it and it'll sound fine and whatever. Um, we put it out and it was like, it was not like this insane overnight thing, but it sort of felt like it where like I would just get like 10 to 20 friend requests a day 
from people on the internet because they're just posting videos of us playing it. And our Facebook page went from like 200 likes to 2,000 likes. And it was like this really wild thing of like, look at this guy. He's got this crazy guitar technique. And look at this drummer. He's like all over the place. And it was like, they're the new whatever. And they would compare us to some two piece band that I had never heard of. And I was like, oh man, that's, that's pretty wild. So from that one thing, you know, uh, we got an offer to go to the UK and play um, this huge festival for that kind of music called Arctangent, um, which we did the next year. And it was kind of like this upward spiraling story of like, I did put in all this time and effort. And then it was like for a while, it was like, like for a couple months, it was just like, am I just wasting my time with this? Because I don't even know if this is like worth it or whatever. But it was like just super fulfilling for myself. And it wasn't really about that. And it wasn't about getting a bunch of followers or anything about that. It was just like, I want to try to like musical experiments, but also just trying to push myself to do as well as I can. Yeah, you had you had like a fascination or maybe potentially even an obsession um, to to learn this technique and now it's become sort of the the base of what what it is that you do in the music that you're that you're creating and also certainly the the attention that you've been getting you know i as i'm looking around and doing my research i i see kind of a bio for you for you on spotify on your uh, on your standards and it the way it describes you i, I don't know if, you know if you wrote that or if someone from your band wrote that but it specifically talks about uh how you well, not from your band, but from your from your crew, from your posse. Yeah. But uh, it talk it talks about how um, you specifically, you know, came up making like video content, unique video content about uh, the music that you're doing. And I've seen so much stuff where, you know, like I think even the other day you guys posted something about like you were literally like riding a longboard, like playing your guitar with a little portable amp in this way. So like, where did where did the video side of that come in for you? Um. I had like posted guitar videos on Facebook, but it was like just me playing it. It would get like seven likes. And I was like, oh, that's fun. You know, I'm glad people <laughs> like it. You know, I wasn't like, I think there's like a huge culture too. Now it's like clout meets music and people want that oh, yeah. really badly. And people just go crazy on the internet. They want to do like all sorts of insane things. And I uh, was with the drummer at the time and we were trying to figure out like, stuff that we could do because we would we posted like a clip of us playing for the first time and we covered a song by another band and uh it was like this really crazy guitar tapping thing too but it was like a perfect transcription that i had made and that got you know a lot of attention but then it was like how can we follow that up we need something like original and we had all sorts of like crazy ideas we would just write down so this is like some of the stuff that we used to do is like um the drummer bought like a Hello Kitty drum set, which is like a little toy drum set. It's not meant to be played professionally. And he's like, I'm just going to, sure. I'm just going to shred on this thing. And so we took our hardest song where I have to like flip my left hand orientation from, you know, it's like on the neck and all that stuff. I have to flip it upside down and play upside down on the neck and then flip it back just to make the part work essentially. And uh, he's playing this Hello Kitty drum set and that thing went around Facebook a lot and I was just like I would wake up every day and at the time I think my internet had gone out because I was living right near school and we were I was living in this mountain area with no wi-fi reception so I would go to sleep and the video would be like whatever 100 likes and then I'd wake up and I would just go out or something and it, it like shot up like 200 likes and then every day it would just shoot up like more and more and more and I was just like what the hell like this is so crazy people think this is like good like it's just us messing well around. now this is a thing right it's the uh i feel like isn't it uh jimmy fallon who does this now too with uh with their band they do like they play on kids instruments and they have musicians sing along with that like this has become like kind of a cultural thing to play impressive things on really really like like i don't know whether it's kids instruments or just like basic instruments well i don't it's not it's not like it, it wasn't like something that was like an original idea it's definitely been like done before so many times but it's just like yeah we were doing this really weird style of music it's like i guess that's what you call math rock it's like very like that's the other term that i found for you guys yeah because it's it's like you're doing some calculation on how intense your time signatures are and just like it, it's it, so precise it's a lot of odd time signature grooves so yeah. um that's the thing i was talking about earlier with danceability a lot of people have the problem of like how do you make this danceable how do you make 
like everyone's so used to four and it's like you know on the two and the four you're you're swinging back and forth and that's that's where right. people dance that's how all songs are and so we both went to school at cal arts um the original drummer and i and there they have a big world music department and learning uh stuff you're just hearing you you don't even have to take a class there you can just hear other people playing you're just like whoa this is the seven how are you making seven sound so groovy it's like there's yeah. there are infinite possibilities that you hear in world music and it's it's kind of like um the, the way that i describe it is like you eat like a like a mayonnaise sandwich and you're like oh man this is the pinnacle of <laughs> of like taste or whatever and then you have yeah. some like bomb ass cuban food and you're just like yeah. oh man the spice and like it's like just you know i i i, I don't want to get all weird for a sec but it's like four four yeah, four four is like the white man's like taste it's like oh this is spicy and good this four four and then it's like <laughs> no check out this seven man check out this like, yeah. like let's you know check you can check out something even crazier so I, i've kind of been talking about that but i can kind of demonstrate so it's the memes of it's the memes of white people food where yeah it's like what did you season the chicken with yeah it's like well salt and pepper like pepper gives it a real kick yeah no like, no Andrea that's, loves that's that. exactly what 4-4 is if i had to do an analogy <laughs> but then when you but have... it's not even people don't but that's the thing though is that people don't want to go outside of those boxes there's so many people that don't want to experience something new or like try try that new thing and that that is the thing that makes me it's, sad. It's the culture. Like, it's the it's the culture. It has yeah. nothing to do with like you know. Oh, I can't. It's really hard to find. And it took me going to art school before I was like, oh, this is how seven groups. And I have a guitar teacher there that I've been taking lessons with for two years. And he is from a country that no longer exists it's called Yugoslavia. So he's from the eastern side of Europe. And he's like, yeah, dude, from around there, everybody dances in five. And I'm like, how are people dancing in five? One, two, three, four, five. That's like not a dance. The dance is one, two, three, four. You know, like that's how everybody dances. And he's like, no, 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 check this out, dude. So what you need to know is that all music, everything that's ever been done, essentially, is all twos and threes. Everything that you can sing can be broken down into a two or a three. So if you just clap the accent of the two and the three two plus three equals five so you can flip that you can go like three and two or you can go two and three so i'll demonstrate so you have one two three four so that's four two and then you have five did that feel like five to you what did that feel like no, it felt like some sort of swinging four. I mean, my part of the problem is the latency of my internet connection now. Okay. Um, but I, th I think I know where you're going. Yeah. So it's it's like uh, it's like one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five. But you're just feeling the downbeats. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's that's five. Yeah, you get like a heartbeat there. Yeah. No, people 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 dance to that in like other areas of the world. Yeah. But in the United States, it's like um, yeah. it, I would be so surprised if any song i heard like her turn on the radio it's like oh yeah that's, there's that five like no that does never happens and yeah. you can do the same thing with seven so you go so that's seven one two one two one two three one two one two one two three so two plus two plus three is seven and then you do that with 11 you do that with 13 you can you can you can go all the way up to like 21 35 whatever you can just kind of do those big beats and do them really fast and it, it just sounds like a clave pattern kind of it sounds like just like a latin groove or it sounds like some other groove you know from another part of the world and so our main focus was like how do we do that you know we're gonna have parts in four but we want to have some parts that aren't in four and we want to like trip people up and i want i, want, I still want people to kind of dance to it a little bit you know and that's not really a thing that anybody ever really tried to do before um just because you don't really you know you i was so fo fixated on four and then you see this other thing and it's like okay how do we combine this other thing in four and that's like for me at least what the math rock thing is about some people just do it to like confuse people like i'm just going to do this song in 13 it's going to be confusing nobody's going to be able to understand what's going on yeah no one's understanding what's going on and they're walking out they don't want to see your band anymore like right yeah <laughs> it's that it's the disconnect between like i'm making something that appeases me as an artist versus like i'm going to i'm going to push you as an audience but i'm still going to give you something that that can please you because i mean ultimately isn't that sort of why people go to shows like to enjoy something so, I, it's, I don't. There's something there to me. Yeah. No. Totally. No. Exactly. Um, 
So that I mean that was that's... So how do you how do you get to that point to where people can actually dance and stuff? Well, I mean, it's not something that we do that much anymore, but it was definitely like when everything had started, that was kind of the the key to it. And I mean, that's just that's just me trying to explain kind of where we were coming from um just when we were starting out and it's just it's a whole world of like experimenting with meter experimenting with with like you said the, the alternative guitar technique and it was like this fresh thing i guess that people really sunk their teeth into and um ever since then you know just have no problem touring anywhere like before it was really hard to even get gigs in la like we were just like trying to figure out where to play and now it was like we were getting offers to play in all sorts of places like canada mexico uk all over the united states like it was total flip of the script like within a year it was totally totally wild and i mean going from that like posting a guitar video seven likes and then going from that to like you wake up every other day someone has an email for you about like hey i want to let you know that you know we i book shows here and blah, blah 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 and love to have you and all that stuff so it's like it was pretty trippy and especially for a band that's like focusing on like yeah, we're doing uh, weird stuff with meter, and I look at me, I don't have a bassist. We're playing guitar, you know. With like, <laughs> you know, it's like it's it's wild. It's super wild. Yeah, to be able to get in that mainstream without and still be able to be accepted, and people are interested in what it is that you're doing, and kind of like right in that line. I'm a my my brain is is breaking a little bit because I started I started hearing myself on your connection. Do you have headphones or anything like that? I don't know why I started hearing myself. Oh, no, it's cool. Uh, let me let me get that going. Let me get that okay. going for you. Because I wasn't here when we started, but then I just started hearing myself echoing back. It's such a weird thing, but like when you're doing a podcast, if you hear yourself a second later, you'll literally forget everything you were thinking about. <laughs> no, I, no I, I understand. How's that? <laughs> I well, I haven't heard in a second, so I think we may be good. Okay, cool. I put on some yeah. headphones. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, okay, well now I got to think about what I was what I was actually going to ask about. So the 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 drummer that you were with initially, this is your you're now working with someone new then from Atlanta, or like what's what's the deal with the drummer situation? Yeah, so it's been kind of a weird thing. Like basically since 2019, it's been like a solo project of mine. Um, just cause yeah. uh, like I, I I just took it in a different direction essentially, and we stopped working together. And um, since then, it's pretty much been like my solo project. And I uh, every year, essentially, I've just been working with somebody new. Um, it's just like it doesn't work out for one reason or the other. And it's I, it's just more or less, I guess, like my thing now. So it's not like, you know, people definitely like certain people over others. It's like I liked when that person played with standards versus with this person. But it's like just my sort of thing now. And uh, like I appear in all the content now and I appear by myself. So one day I hope to get somebody that's like super committed to continue doing it for a long time. But it's also like very nice to just like be like, Hey, this is what's happening. And then everyone's like, cool, that's what's happening. It's like, uh, yeah. Bands with like four or five people. It's like, you're all, you all have different opinions and it's hard to, to get anywhere with it. But it's like me, I'm just, I'm working at fast pace, can do whatever I want really. Yeah. You get the chance to work with different people too, which probably helps evolve the music and, and challenge you and do new things. Yeah. But the other thing that, that I was thinking was like, like you, uh, you made a way so that you could play the guitar uh, as one person and sound like you're playing the guitar as two or three people, and so it's almost like you just need to now find a way where you can play the drums also. So this whole thing can yep. just be nope, totally. Oh, you're getting kind of selfish on the instruments there. I I can feel it. <laughs> no, I mean some guitarists do like backing track drums. I hate that. Like I think drumming is like one of those things you're gonna have a hard time ever replacing it. I think that it'll just never go away. Drumming is just like very integral to like our culture it's integral to who we are as people like that rhythm having something that's rhythmic and live i think that's like super important i'll never always have somebody playing drums but i've experimented with like bringing in keyboards and all this other stuff but doing it in like a backing track situation so you know we're playing to click track and then through the, the house pa you've got like um keyboard and percussion coming through but um probably just going to keep it the same way and just add little bits of things here and there just, just to spice it up you know yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, I think drums, are, it's one of those instruments that can make a guitar sound crisp, because otherwise it just starts to get kind of muddy. There's too much. It just starts to float around on its own, and the drums kind of kind of cut off the sound of the guitar in a way that I think keeps it, especially when you're talking about the time signatures you're using, to keep everything really sharp on exactly what you're trying to hit in that moment, so that the reverb doesn't start to like confuse your listeners. Like, if you, like, I've listened to just pure, like, old 
jazz guitar stuff and when there's no percussion with it you just get kind of lost in it yeah it's hard sometimes it's hard to follow around like the uh right you know yeah that's just just a just a passing thought there but yeah um so how do you i mean how do you keep it all straight when you're on stage then like how how are you able to as you're as you're changing time signatures and everything is it all is it all predetermined do you do any sort of like improv while you're on it and all you and you know you keep the the time signature really clear but you're sort of improving moments of it or how does that work yeah definitely definitely not improving <laughs> it's like like i said when i was talking about stanley jordan it's really hard to do that um with the tapping stuff for me and it's, it's hard to do it in right. general um but yeah no it's definitely all pre predetermined but sometimes it's like you're counting something and you're like oh man this is this is a little nutty <laughs> like I need, and i think that's just like the new stuff is a little bit more straight ahead like it's definitely more about just that common groove but it's also just like you can do a lot of stuff with 4-4 four, four as well. It's not, it's not like you just have to, it's like, oh, 4-4 four, four is, you know, I did say earlier, it's like, oh, it's just like, you know, salt and pepper on chicken. It's just like, you know, whatever, mayonnaise sandwich. But it is, there's is a lot of things you can do with it. It's just how you use it. And I think a lot of people use it like that. But it's like, there's a lot of stuff you can do in 4-4. Four, four. It's like, wait, that was in 4-4? Four, four? And there's even stuff that I've heard and I'm just I'm like, wait, what time is this? Oh, dude, it's four. Right. It's just like really all over the place. Just the way you count things is really... Can, it, it's just a never-ending thing like I'm, like i've been saying and um so yeah i mean there's that um but yeah it, it it is it is trickier because i think a lot of people can go up there and you can kind of just focus more on having a good time and performing but for me it's like man if i don't focus a little bit this is this is gonna right. go south really fast so it is a little yeah. trickier it is the trade-off of like doing something a little bit more technical and complex yeah you've got i feel like you must have certain musicians where it's like okay especially on guitar like i'm gonna get up there and like i've got this solo like i've got to cover these eight bars with this solo or 16 bars or whatever and and those are the musicians i feel like that can have a beer or two before the show you know just loosen it all up because that's going to be the idea when you get there but i feel like for you you must be in like the focus zone the whole time to pull this off right I, yeah it used to be more like that and i would just stand in place and i think like a lot of musicians play like math <laughs> rock or they play prog rock it's like they're literally just standing there and it's just like uh, yeah you know, presenting because you're at your limit thing, of like how like, many things your body can handle yeah but where i've tried to change it up now is like okay just i i try to get that squared away as soon as possible so just like tons of reps of the song and just tons of like practice of it muscle memory and then getting on stage the song is just like performing it's like my last worry it's like i can perform it any day in my sleep and then when I get up there, I can run around and like I can like jump in the audience or whatever, which I've, is fun. Try to do that while you're like jumping into the crowd or whatever. But I try to engage the audience more because I feel like that's more important than getting the song 100 percent. I'd rather get it like 90 or 80 percent correct and just have make sure people have a lasting impression of, of what's going on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think well, I think that makes a ton of sense. I think that's how you don't lose an audience because it's not all about the one thing. You're like they get to be a part of it with you because you're going to include them. And and I don't think any audience member is going to be like, oh, that wasn't a hundred percent. They're going to be like, that was a great show. You'd be surprised. Like, that's what you. You'd be surprised. Do you th- is it is that part of the community here in terms of math rock? People who go to those shows are expecting some sort of like musical perfection. It can be. I mean, I think it's obvious. Like if you can't play some of the stuff, you can. You're, you're doing in the studio then it's it's messed up like there are bands that like like speed up guitar parts or like there are bands like there's been controversy over people posting videos of parts that they can't play and then you see them oh, live yeah. and, like it, they can't play it <laughs> you know at all singers this is singers too like i like not to single out any bands but you you hear the stories about these bands it's like the stuff they're recording in studio is incredible and the album was incredible and they can't perform live because they don't actually have it. It's all computers. It's all a big show. Yeah. Like it's, it's really, it's really tough. You, all, you obviously tell. though, but like with singers, it's like, you're relying on an organ. It's like your, your voice box. It's like, if, if it's too cold that day, it's really hard to sing. If you have, yeah, I absolutely. mean, Oh my God, if you have the cold, good luck, like performing this insane thing that you could barely do in the studio as a guitar player. I feel right. like there's fewer excuses. It's like, you, there's really hardly any instance where it's like you're going to be crippled to the point of you can't play like you have like really debilitating stomach flu but even then it's like you could probably pull it off it's muscle memory so it's like it, even then it's like less of an excuse because it's just like you're just doing it to showboat whereas like like a singer i can almost understand if you're like putting together takes that you know you couldn't really nail it the whole way through it's like i can't understand that because it's like you're relying on something that's like so physical and it's like singing is such a physical thing too it's like using your whole body and pushing air through your whole body and it's like 
you, the slightest thing happens to you, like you sleep with the window open, and it's like, oh, now my throat hurts and I can't sing as well. You know? Right. Yeah. So you think it's more like physical in singing, but more maybe mental when you're playing a guitar. But then I would say even then you can have off mental days like that happens. You, you get you're just foggy. You didn't sleep well. You're nervous someone just broke up with you right before the show like that stuff can happen too like yeah. it, has there been any like gnarly performance where you're like whoa i gotta get my head in this and, and you're you're struggling yeah like, i mean what, what is hard for you it's just having a bad day on tour but even then i it's muscle yeah. memory at that point it's just like i'm not as stoked visibly on stage as i could have been you know but it's I, that's just my perspective i think everybody can experience it differently but i feel like guitar players like altering performances it's like it's just it's just so unnecessary it's it's especially if you're gonna have to play that stuff every night it's not like a singer where it's like you know the crowd will sing and it'll kind of like be a part of this thing it doesn't matter if you couldn't hit that note 100 percent of the time um i think with the guitarist it's like if you're not nailing it constantly it's just like why'd you write it this is or yeah you're just not gonna have any fun you know yeah 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 right, so let me take it let me take us back to to uh the beginnings here because uh i i always like to kind of get a an idea of how you come to do the thing that it is that you do so you know you mentioned like mom wanted you to get uh a, a real job type degree go and in, in for political science and things like that guitar was like a side thing what's the uh what's the musical background for you did you grow up listening to a lot of music or have no uh like a family member or anything like that no, it's all you nobody in my family plays music i have like people that dabble like my grandfather was a drummer and he owned a drum set when world war ii broke out so he was like 12 or 13 i think and he was playing wedding gigs because all the bands were drafted and all the people in the bands were drafted. Whoa. so he was like the only gigging drummer in his area in new york for like a long time because he just he's like i have a, i have a drum set and i can do like i can keep time but he was like not a good drummer he was just like you know that's what he did you know when he was 13 but i mean i've had family members dabble and stuff but it's more of just like uh do it for your college resume thing and like you can perform this this flute thing and uh you'll you'll get this award and then you can get this award and turn it into like college currency essentially but it was never like oh yeah i, I went to yeah. i went to school with lots of people who like like i know one person who played the cello and it was literally because you could get a full ride if you played the cello and played in the orchestra like yep. that was mm -hmm. that was the goal because cellists are wanted or something like that yeah no it's it's just like um they have no understanding of it. If I got, I had to had to talk about any of the stuff I had to talk about. None of them would have any understanding of what I'm what I'm saying. So, it's like, it was kind of like that. And again, it's just like, the separation of like, okay, entertainment, all this other stuff. That's just like this other thing. But you know, you're gonna have to become like a doctor or a lawyer or something. And everybody in my family is a doctor, a lawyer, or something of that nature. Where it's like high caliber master's degree phd that's your expectation like my expectation was i was supposed to go to stanford i didn't get into stanford so it's like like um that's the family that i came from so it was really awkward for a brief time because like i said i you know upload a guitar video and get like seven likes and then i'm like yeah i'm gonna be a guitar player and everyone's kind of looking at me like, right yeah dude i don't know about that one like <laughs> i don't think that's gonna pan out for you that's a pretty heavy expectation that, that you would go to stanford that that's an Ivy League institution, if I'm not mistaken. Like that's pretty, that that's difficult to get into. Stanford, yeah, I had a friend. Correctly. I had a friend with a 5.0 in high school, and uh, he got into Stanford. But I mean, that's that's like the level you have to be. It's just like right standing top of the top, top of the top, yeah. exactly. But I mean, I was just not, my head wasn't in it, and it's like my head is very much in like like I went down this huge rabbit hole of like doing all this guitar tapping, like I described earlier. But it's like I I only did that because I was extremely interested in it, and it was like anything i wasn't extremely interested in i did not want to do it and that came to school it's like okay you're gonna have to memorize the, the chemical table and so i like my sister is like super motivated by like challenge and like if teacher tells you to do something you're gonna do it but for her it was like oh if you tell me to do something i'm gonna do it and it's like if you tell me to memorize the chemical table my response is gonna be like why why do i have to do that yeah. so it's like total total terrible student mentality and um i think that's just kind of like something that at first, it's like, oh, you're not smart or whatever. But then as I became older, it's like, no, I'm just a different kind of person. And I think that's all that's worked to my benefit in terms of like progressing what I've done and uh, my career and stuff. And I think I hope that it continued to to do that. But it was just a very yeah, it's, it's not that you're it's not that you're not intelligent. It's just you don't like the mold. You don't like the you don't like those rules. They don't make sense. And, and frankly, most of them don't really have a good reason. Like like 
half of school is just memorize this thing. That's not a good reason to do it. Not not now that we've got uh, the resource of the world like literally in our pockets all the time. Yeah, it's a, Why would it's you a different time things? a little bit. I mean, it still yeah. is, but it's like also I think school, you know, public school at least, you know, in my experience, it was very much just like uh, make if someone tells you to do something, you should do it. And I think it just it prepares you for when you get a real job. It's like if someone tells you to do something, you're going to do it. You're not going to be like, why, though? And those people, it's like you have to find your own path a little bit. It's not you're not meant for like a regular job of that sort. And then like I would do odd jobs and stuff because I was like recording something. It was like, man, I need to come up with a couple thousand dollars. So I just start working. And it was like, that's really how you have to be. You cannot question authority. You have to like fit the mold. And it's like just so hard for me to do. Um, and I'm lucky enough now that I like don't have to really do that anymore. Um, it's just it's just been nice to liberate myself in that way of like I can create my own sort of thing and I can just live in that sphere and it's yeah it's it's not a challenge so did you grow up in LA then is that where you went to schools yeah I I actually grew up in a a suburb called Long Beach so it's um it's actually south of LA so it's kind of detached from LA uh I guess claim to fame would be like uh snoop dog that's like his his place long beach that's like his whole thing so i i went to the same high school snoop dog went to and like nice. 40 people from the nfl the high school i went to was very much like um Whoa. football high school yeah it's like if you couldn't go to uh whatever private league thing you would just go to this high school and so um i don't know if you know this guy his name's juju and he's like a nfl player uh he he was in my graduating year or something or maybe a year ahead of me but oh that's cool yeah it's just like that was the environment it's like we're gonna go to college right. we're gonna go to the nfl and everyone else can go fuck themselves it's like it, it wasn't <laughs> like that but it was like you know um i i didn't it's a football school. yeah i didn't have many people around me that were like that into music and if they were it was just like yeah i'm doing this so i can get into uc whatever ucla right you know, it's just like i'm not right. doing this because i'm like genuinely that interested in music and so like on weekends i was like not doing homework i was just like you know, recording tons of stuff and just playing music all the time. And it was like super fun. Cause I was like, I stuck at school all day and all I want to do is go home and play music. And then I had to do all that. And then I would have to like last minute do my homework or just not do it. Take the, take the, app. Yeah. so it was like really, really miserable experience <laughs> to be honest. Did it, did it start as guitar? Was that the first instrument for you? Uh, well, I started playing piano when I was five, started playing violin when I was eight. But again, it was like that mentality of like, I'm doing this because it's, impressive i'm not doing this because it's like i want to do it it's just like other people adults see like he can play whatever on the piano and it's like and that's a funny thing too. yeah it's supposed to be good for your for your brain as a young kid like that's why my parents i think signed me up for piano it's like it's supposed to be good developing your brain to have music and especially piano in yeah particular. but i mean i i wasn't actually learning the piano i was learning how to like do a series of motions and it wasn't i wasn't yeah. actually learning anything it was just like you know learn this performance and then do that performance right and then it, it it's just like that's you know, that's kind of how it starts for all kids, but it's also, like, very silly. It wasn't until, like, I was 11 or 12, I got a drum set, and I got an electric guitar the same year, and I was like, oh, man, this is sick. And then I was, like, actively seeking out information on my own, and that was when I felt like I was really making that connection to to, to playing music, and it was, like, it's pretty nuts, uh, just, like, how much of a rabbit hole I went down, um, and then just playing in tons of bands all the time, like, every month or two just making a new band and just being like all right we have this we're gonna play this show in this, this dude's backyard so another thing is like long beach like la is a very big performing arts city is like lots of places to play in long beach there are like none if you're under 21 years old so uh, you'd play like house shows that was like the whole thing and it's kind of how i found out about diy culture just do it yourself so we're talking about anything that you need to do you just do it yourself and you figure out how to do it so it's like, all right, there's no venues except for that pizza restaurant. We're going to make our venue and we're going to like learn how, well, how do you run sound? Let's fi- fi- we're going to figure it out. We're going to run sound somehow. You know, we're going to like, how do you schedule a show? We're going to figure it out. It's just like, you just do it yourself. And yeah, I was like, until I was like 19 or something. And even then, like the first standard shows that we were playing, all DIY shows, all like running it ourselves, like. Right. You know, it was it's it's pretty it's a pretty extensive culture. It's still like very relevant to what I do. And um, 
that just another and you thing. learn every aspect of it like when you're in the dirt and you're you're you have to know i mean because i came up that that exact same way with music where it was like you know just you're just in a bunch of bands that's what you do in high school and you play at various people's parties and and things like that and that's just kind of how you learn how to do that and then you start learning about sound you start learning about even a bit of recording and things like that and it's all you just got to make it up for yourself but when you are able to do that it literally means you learned everything from the ground up like you know the smallest piece of the smallest piece how it works and i think that that's crucial i don't think enough people probably have that knowledge because they can be so specialized but it's it's so good to know those those small pieces because that's kind of how you i think how you set yourself apart in 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 those ways um although like for me playing music was mostly about the girls like that was the main <laughs> probably reason to do it was like i could sing and i would pick up a guitar i picked up guitar because then i could have a reason to sing and play guitar That's funny. and that was just a big win for the girls i felt in high school which it probably in retrospect it probably wasn't it's... Like it was probably the worst thing i could have done um but that's what you did. Yeah, no, that's no, that's that's fair. I uh, I didn't I didn't really see anybody. It was just it's funny. Like I kind of thought the same thing when I started myself, but I was obviously more interested in playing guitar than I was actually like, right. getting a girlfriend or whatever. But I had never I'd never really saw that happen, you know, in in full until standards was becoming more of a thing, and then I would just have like random girls talk to me, and I was just like, oh. So it is real. It's not just like some lie that I was told. It's like a real thing. And it's <laughs> Yeah, you have a more genuine it wasn't so so music wasn't a means to that end, which I think for many of us it probably is. But it was it was the means in itself and then the end is, is sort of lovely yeah. by the attention. Well yeah. But but I mean it's uh, not my girlfriend, so it's like it's okay. So I, I think it all's all's well that ends well. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Um what's with the fruit? What is the fruit thing? I, you, I, you know, see in your Instagram, you got fruit everywhere. There's fruit pillows everywhere. You always seem to have some sort of fruit uh, thing attached to your guitar on occasion. Yeah. Uh, what's what's the fruit thing? Yeah, I mean, it's just a little weird. It's like, um, so we had put out nothing, essentially, when we first started in 2017. It was like late 2017. We had put out like no no music. 2018, we decided to put out that EP, the one I was talking about, and like being a band with no lyrics, we have no vis- you know, auditory identity essentially. It's just what is being heard or whatever. And I'd always wanted yeah, to. Yeah, there's do no something poetry with... to tell people. Yeah, I'd always, what I'd always want to do something with fruit. Anyways, like we'd even talked about naming the band after like a fruit in a different language or something, like something like that. And we came up with this idea of like all these fruits in a ring like in a circle basically and we had one of the old drummer's friends make it and we got it back and we were just like man this is sick like this is so cool and it was also just a really good vision like um really good comparison because we were playing this really it was like very happy sounding riffs with like all this complexity and it was just like oh man that's kind of like fruit it's like kind of cool and uh, we put it out there and people just like ate it up. They just never seen anything like that. It was just like a lot. And we would have people bring us fruit. People would come to shows dressed as fruit. It was wild. And we sold out of like all of those fruit ring shirts. People wanted all this fruit ring stuff and stickers, fruit stickers. Like it just like clicked so hard. And it wasn't something that we were just like making abstract. It was just like, no, this is like something that we're really interested in. And it kind of just took off from there. And then for the second EP, I was like, I think we should do anamorphic fruit. Like we should do fruit that is like, you know, like, like it's like uh, these little cute fruit characters or whatever. Like, I think it would be super sick. So I introduced this like dancing watermelon essentially. And so uh, that's on the second EP. And that was like really cool. Cause like anything with that guy on it, people just loved it. Like people loved the shirts and the merch. And I think right now there's like five or six tattoos that people have of that guy from the second EP cover. And Whoa. it's like, he's, he's taken on his li- a life of his own. And <laughs> so in the new, so uh, all we've done so far is EPs, which is just like four or five songs. It's like nothing. And now uh, in the new record, which is like full length, it's like our full first proper release. It's going to come out this summer. Uh, we've got him and like a bunch of his friends so it's like it just took on a life of its own and people love it and i love it and i feel like it just represents the music really well 
So that's kind of just why we've done it. Um, and I'm just going to continue to do it probably in some form. Do you particularly enjoy eating fruit? Like, is that yes, good for you? Yeah, and I was born or maybe now. It no, is. yeah, and I wasn't going to the grocery store for the last month, basically. Like, I do little shopping trips, but just for, like, pasta or, like, microwave food. So I, I didn't eat fruit for, like, a month about, you know, just, like, little bits here and there. But I yesterday I made a fruit salad with a bunch of fruit that I got because I just did a big shopping trip at, a, it's like, a Costco-like store. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. It's really, really great. It's hard to get... It's hard to get your hands on fresh food right now, man. I mean, yeah. It's, well, it's, it's also uh, just scary. It's just like, man, I don't know who's touched this fruit. I don't know like where it's been. You, absolutely. Can, you can go down like a thought, a thought hole of like, what is, what's going on with this fruit? It's a little suspicious. But I, I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna do it. And uh, I mean, I live in California, so it's like fresh produce is not a problem, but it's also just like a little freaky, you know? Yeah, it's also a pretty populated area, and it's like, is is it pretty? strict lockdown where you're at right now like i've heard obviously where i'm at in tucson the rules are going to be way less strict it's just not quite as big of a city it's there's a lot of country area so some things are still open probably this shouldn't be but it's just a lot it's a lot more kind of laid back that's part of the reason we came out here to wait this thing out yeah is it is it pretty heavy lockdown for you guys where you're at yeah i mean you can't you can't really like go anywhere like um I got my tires changed because I actually got a flat tire in the middle of all this, which is, like, terrible. Oh. Yeah, so I had to go to a – I went to, like, a tire repair shop, and nobody gave a fuck. Like, nobody was wearing a face mask. I was just like, man, I'm going to I'm gonna get sick now. But that's that was a while ago, so I think I'm fine. But it's – Well, you know they say if you're in good health that it's, like, something – it's a higher rate than they thought before, but it's something like 50 to 70% of people – don't are completely asymptomatic even if you get this thing yeah i i i think we'll find out more about how it's going i almost like think that i probably am not you know immune like i probably don't have those antibodies but regardless i've been pretty lucky i've been feeling pretty good the whole time but it's like yeah it's it's pretty strict lockdown and when everything was going into effect like i was scared to even leave the house because i didn't nobody really knew anything about this thing so i didn't leave my house and then after like four or five days of that i was like terrible and so i started going on walks every day and you can do that you can do a lot of stuff you can't there's everything in public is closed essentially um i've heard that some people get pulled over here and if you can't explain where you're going and why they'll give you a ticket you know if you're just going to hang out with your buddies or whatever um right but yeah it's like it, it, it there are like strict guidelines but it's more there's no actual enforcement it's not like they're bringing out the military everything i think california just wanted to curve what's happening here because of the high population because it didn't want to be another new york new york is like pretty nuts right now and i think it's going to be that way for a while yeah yeah well so you'll be doing your best to get back on the road as soon as you can when does the uh when does the album come out will it come out still or is that going to have to take a a pause for a little bit yeah it is it just sucks because we had you know a definitive timeline in in mind and i think a lot of bands did and they've been completely demolished by this thing because it's like you back up everything you do with tours, like all the touring that you're doing um, is based around releasing music. So now it's like um, bands are just dropping albums now without tours in mind. Like a lot of bands are dropping albums right now because everybody's at home and it's like, well, we couldn't do this tour, but you know what we're going to do um, this at this album anyways. And um, even though, you know, so you, you really want to put an album out around the time you're going to be touring. But if everybody did that, we're going to be waiting like over a year and a half you know so yeah um we're gonna wait a little bit put it out um just because i want to keep like we had a, a more extensive tour schedule to back it up and now that we don't have that it's like we are not really in a rush to put it out so hopefully we're looking at july um and also just you know supply chains for a lot of bands have been stagnated so um we're signed to a record label now and they get all their stuff from different parts of europe so having that vinyl pressed from over there and then having it come over here or like different parts of CDs. Like it's going to be a little challenging to get that all together. So we just need more time. And uh, I think the summer is a good time because I think everyone's still going to be chilling. I don't think anything is going to reopen by the summer. So I think it'll be a good time to put it out. And I'm really excited because it's the most work I've ever put into a release. And it, it goes beyond just like me doing my nerdy experiments on guitar. It's like, I think the songs are legitimately well-written. Um, I, I did like a really uh, I, I just tried really hard to make him sound really good. And I think I, I did a good job executing it in the studio, just being like, I, I've had a lot of like studio failures. I just feel like very unsatisfied every time I leave, but I feel very, very happy about how this turned out. So 
um i'm like really excited to put it out we already have a new song out from that album it's called special berry you can check it out on spotify and all that awesome what's the name of the new album too fruit island fruit island yeah. okay bring it back the fruit i love yep. it um so well i i'll need to come and see you at some point when when you guys are probably most likely when you're on tour because i don't find myself in los angeles a lot yeah. um so i'll have to come link up with you while on your tour obviously this whole podcast strangers worth meeting yeah. the whole thing's about meeting so uh as soon as we can i'll be at your show and we'll we'll get to hang out and and uh, I'll get to check it out for real. I'm I'm looking forward to it, man. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully um, it happens. I'm I think there's probably not gonna be any shows until next summer. But you know, I think this yeah. is a good time for everybody to just be creative and um, try to just have fun. I I I'm a little wary of people just trying to lift this thing a little too soon. I, I'm not sure that's the right move right now. You know. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll wait patiently. Yeah. And then we'll and then we'll enjoy it. Yeah, totally. When it's the right time. Yeah. I'd be uh I I do kind of also i mean we've, we've talked so much about music today um but i i also do like to kind of talk with guests about like what else is it that that makes you you like what what other things do you get into what else you, do you do with your time other other interests or passions that you have is there is there anything else we uh, other rabbit holes we should go down yeah i mean it's a weird one because like um you know i was talking earlier about like how you know a lot of my family is just kind of like what are you doing the music thing I had such an adverse reaction to that reaction of like, it was just like, oh yeah, you want to see how crazy I can get with it? I'm going to go nuts. I'm going to like do it all the time. And so for a very long time, if you asked me the question, I would have no answer for you. It was like, right. I, right. This was the obsession. It was something to prove. Yeah. Well, it's like, I, I, it's like, if I wasn't, it's like, if I get tired of playing guitar, I'm just going to start mixing music. If I get tired of mixing music, I'm going to go do this other thing. And it's just always about music nonstop, constantly. And it wasn't until last year or so that I started to loosen up and I was able to do like other things. And it was, it's, I've realized it's all a balance. It's like, you can do music all the time if that makes you happy. And it was making me happy for a while, but sometimes it wasn't. And I was just like, would still force myself to do it. You want to have a good balance of everything. And so I've been trying to get into other things now. Um, but I mean, I've always like really enjoyed watching cinema, like super into that. And um, uh, I've been super into chess for the last couple of years and I've been trying to get better at that. It's, not an easy thing to get better at because it's like it's like very much like a sl an upward slope of like every time you get like a little bit better the next inch of better is like harder to get because it's just like there's so yeah. much <laughs> stuff to figure out and it's a crazy game right. and i love it um but strategy games in general like i never really got video games when i was growing up like um my mom was very much like okay it's just a waste of time you need to be working on you know school stuff or whatever and so i never had video games i had like a wii we um in like 2008 or something and then it broke you're describing my childhood by the way same exact yeah thing. yeah so i had like a Wii for a second it was like it was yeah. like whatever but it wasn't like you know i never had those like um moments of uh you know owning halo or any video games or like most movies for a very long time until you know i was much older and so um recently i got a ps4 i've never had a game console before that but i had like a game boy advance and the ps2 very briefly when i was at my dad's and this wii u and then i or this wii and then i finally got a ps4 and i'm like now i'm like a gamer it's like wild so i've, I've been combining my love for like star wars and video games and i've been playing a lot of star wars battlefront 2 it's like that game is so much fun like for a star wars fan but just for also just a, a first person shooter fan it's just like so much fun it's awesome do you play online yeah i do and it's so much fun like uh i i just I mean, I think like last week I was trying to finish some stuff and I just couldn't because I was just playing so much Star Wars Battlefront. And, like now it's better <laughs> because I like, you know, I, I, I get my kicks just playing like a couple of rounds of whatever game mode. But right. I was playing like four or five hours a day. and I was just like obsessed with just like playing it. And it's no better time to do it because um, we're in the middle of this thing. And it's crazy because I bought the PS4 yeah. right before I went on tour. So I had it for a few days, went on tour, came back, never played it. And then I was supposed to leave on tour again. And I didn't even have the online mode of the game. I was just playing offline because I was like, why would I invest all this money into this online thing? If I can't even play the game, I'm going to be on tour all the time. And now that all the tours are canceled, it's like I bought the online thing. And I was like, I'm just going to go deep on it, you know? 
<laughs> That's awesome. I I try those games. Man, I've tried. I've tried to play online. I'm just, I think I've always been at that level where I'm so bad. I'm just so bad at, at any of those games. Like Battlefront in particular, I played online. And I'll just, all I do is respawn and die. That's the whole game for me. Yeah. And I don't have the attention span to play long enough to get better than that. Yeah. And so by the time I'm done playing, I'm just like, oh, I'm still just as bad as I was. Yeah. I think, I think <laughs> I'm learning also that the weird, like something that I get like a weird kick out of is like me um trying to figure out a new skill that i have like no bearing in like with the chess thing that was like mm-hmm. one thing of like because with music it's just like i've done it forever so it's like i anytime i learn something new in music it's like it, i i could tie it to something else familiar you know what i mean right but with chess it's like it's a completely new thing it's like a, it's like a game but it's also like it's like an art form it's like the slow waltz of like trying to coax your enemy into making a mistake and then seeing that mistake and acting on it and it's like it was such a journey for me. So I, I, I get kind of like a joy in trying to figure out something that I have like no prior experience in, really. Um, like I played chess as a kid and stuff, but it was just like try to take the queen. And, you know, it was not like art and it was like not like this. And um, I get like kind of a kick of like absolutely sucking at something and then being like, OK, now I'm 